So, we want to go over the history of cryptography. I think there are three major, major phases in terms of its history. So, I divided it into classic, modern, and advanced cryptography. And we are currently in the era of advanced cryptography. The winners of the Turing Award for cryptography are those who created a new paradigm or have made great achievements in the area of cryptography technology. And those are have won the Turing Award. Hello, if you look at the definition of classical cryptography in the dictionary, they say it is the art of writing or solving code, codes. But I think this definition is outdated because, because uh, literally, the, it says an art and not a science. And I think that is because in the beginning, cryptography was ensured perfect communication between two parties sharing secret information. And the way that developed was seen as a kind of an art. And to meet the goals of private communication, many things such as codes were created. So today we call that private key encryption. So there are many codes or private key inscriptions uh, that were created over the years. In the past, there was very little theory behind decryption of codes. It was not systematic, or there were no logical uh, theoristy, uh, theory behind it. So cryptography was often seen as heuristic and an unprincipled design analysis. And because there was no theory behind it, the schemes would be proposed, broken, and then repeat. So the beginning of this classical cryptography goes uh, back to the BC era. So this is a very simple uh, type of cryptography. It is the Caesar cipher or a shifting cipher. So you're simply changing the order of the alphabet or the uh, number of the alphabet. And then in a more modern example of cryptography would be Enigma. Enigma was a machine developed by in Germany in the early 20th century and were used by Nazi Germany to encrypt military communications during World War II. So you can see in the photo what it looks like. So there are many pulleys, and every time you press a pulley, the machine would move and there would be a different printed text and the encrypted text. But of course, this was also broken by Turing, as you already know. Nowadays, uh, cryptography has developed even further. In the 70s, IBM developed the Data Encryption Standard, or DES. This was created with consultation with the NSA, and it was slightly modified for use, and was published as an official standard in 1977. And NSA but then again another standard was made in AES because there were concerns that the cryptography security level was too low. So these two would be some examples of classic cryptography. So up to here, you could say that cryptography stayed in the area of art. But from modern cryptography, you can see that art has is going more towards the era of the area of science. So, one of the uh, Rivest is one of also one of the people that I want to talk about today. He said that cryptography is a practice and study of technologies for secure communication in the presence of adversarial behavior. So, compared to the past, it covers a much broader cope. It's not just about private security, it's about data integrity and authentication, and also how to safely move the data into public key settings. Also, the tools used would be more rigorously analyzed. And the theory itself became m much richer during this time. So these kinds of crypto mindset permitted not only cryptography, but other areas of computer security. So what the key questions are, so in the path that we had symmetric key decryption, which, there, which people would have share keys, and then they would decipher the message. But if you want to make the keys 
uh, possible, we, the, the people need to, to meet and share the keys beforehand. So you would know in the past you would see spies have these tiny code books and then they use passwords. I think you might ha have seen that kind of things in movies. But how can we have generate keys without them actually meeting and without a trusted third party? Also, how can we build secure communication without generating so many keys? Because if you want to have different terms of communication, then you had needed a new key every time, so that would be very inefficient. So how can we solve that issue? And the starting point of public key cryptography started in the 1970s. It started from Merkel in 1974. So looking at the winners of the Turing Awards in cryptography, so I just wanted to share some of the people who are relevant to cryptography. So Manuel Blum won in 1995, and Andrew Yao also won it in 2000. Their work was more on the theory of computational complexation. So today I want to talk more about the three uh, groups mentioned in the bottom. So if you look at the uh, actually, my presentation has is kind of not in this order of the winners. So I want to go first talk about talk first about first of all about Diffie and Hellman, who are the most recent winners, and then I will talk about RSA, and then I will talk about Mikali and Goldwasser. And Goldwasser and Mikali are uh, students of Manuel Bloom, who is the 1995 winner. So in 74, so Merkel, who has not, who unfortunately has not won a Turing Award, was an undergraduate student, and he took a computer security course at UC Berkeley and has submitted a seven-page proposal for as for homework. So he submitted it. At that time, his instructor, Professor Hoffman, rejected that rejected that paper. So Hoffman is only uh, known for this. So Merkel was very disappointed and he dropped the course and then he continued on with this uh, research. And then he submitted the paper to the communications of the ACM, in, but it was rejected in 1975. But after many resubmissions and discussions, it was eventually published in 1978. But at the time, there were also, again, many, so many uh, cryptography papers that, were that was published at that time. So it did not receive the credit that it should have received as the first paper for cryptography. So if you, he has a blog and you go to the blog, he has he wrote a very long story and about his complaints about what happened during this time. So it seems he's still hurt about what happened back then. So his idea is to use puzzles. So puzzles are problems that can be solved. If you put in some effort, you can solve these problems. So, if you want to make it into a math, you just need a very short encryption key to solve it. So, the idea of the Merkle puzzle is that's. So I think, let's say I want to t ask one of these people, let's go somewhere nice for dinner, and but the where we go for dinner is secret. So I give you about 10 restaurants, and then I put it, the, the pair the number, a number to the restaurants, and I put it in the puzzle. And then the pe per person who receives the puzzle just needs to pick one of the puzzles and solve it. And then they could well know which puzzle the is number is it is being used and which key is being used. So then I just need to respond with the, you just need to respond with the key. So, but because I'm the one that made the puzzle, I would already know what the I already know how to solve the puzzle, so I would know what the answer is. And for other people, if you just look at the location and number and try to figure out the location, it will take some a lot of math work. So, 
What is the running complexity that I can have with the person I want to communicate with? And then, but there is a complexity gap between the person, between me and the person receiving the puzzle. So, how can we receive, achieve a better gap? So, for example, if I give them a hundred puzzles, then they need to solve all of the puzzles. So it's very complex. So. That kind of creates a complexity gap, and so I would like to create a better gap to make the puzzle better. So if you want to make, how can we make a bigger gap so that not other people cannot easily solve the puzzle? So, again, so Merkley was very disappointed, and then he went to uh, another university, and there he met uh, Diffie and Hellman. And I believe that he was very lucky to have met these two professors because they saw the value of Merkel's work. And then they use more formal language to write a better paper to share that knowledge. So they wrote the groundbreaking paper, New Directions in Cryptography, in 1976. And they published it as soon after they met Merkel. And this was the first time that the idea of asymmetric crypto systems were introduced. So some of the concepts that came out from this paper is the idea of a public key and a private key and that the two could be uh, divided. A public key would be something that is freely distributed and is used can be used for encryption. But the person receiving the key will have a private key that never need to leave the receiving device and it can it is used for this decryption. And things like digital signatures that we often use, for example, if you go to the ATT, if you type in H some of the websites, you can click there, have a lock on some of the websites, and if you click on the websites, you can see the digital signers. So you can be certified that these websites are not, have not been contaminated, and the data is authentic. So these kind of digital signatures could also be uh, a reverse process of the public key. So the Diffie and Hellman, they uh, created the concept of a public key and a private key, and they created something called the key exchange. This is an algorithm. So when two people want to share a secret, they don't have to meet in person. They can share the keys. And so uh, mathematically, it's called the discrete logarithm problem. So in the past, you can say that, co that cryptography was sometimes seen as something in the area of art and simple repetition. But from here on, cryptography started to take on a more scientific and mathematic method. So Diffie and Hillman uh, received the Turing Award a bit later than their actual work, but they received it in 2015 for their work. And but before the new directions in cryptography, they made a concrete algorithm for key exchange, and they made the concept of public key, but they did not exactly uh, provide a scheme for public cryptography. And the reason is because they needed to realize a one-way function, and they couldn't solve it. So the three people on the photo, Adi Shamir, Ron Rivest, and Leonard Adelman, very quickly found a way to solve the one-way function problem. So these three people, so it's called RSA from their last names. And the key they made is called the RSA chapter permutation. So they looked at the question of one-way functions, and they are the first people to actually create a public key. 
And when it comes to some things, the website security like SSL or TLS, uh, the RSA trapdoor is often used. And there are many digital signature schemes as well using RSA. So compared to the people, uh, to the other scientists before them, they, their work was recognized very early on and they won the Turing Award in 2002. So I thought that I had to bring like something technical. So public key it has two picks up two uh, big primes. So it is a n equals p q, and then bring in some kind of like uh, integers, and then put it uh, at e for the encryption and d for uh, decryption, decryption, and for that to you know uh, uncipher like some of the encrypted. Um, message and if you do the uh, factorize the end then you can break the system and if you do that you need to have two big primes and it is very difficult to factorize those two primes so that is a basic belief and I used um, belief the word belief because like theoretically like to um, open uh, the, this brick RSA is not as difficult as factoring so doing the practical like a factoriza factorization it is the only way to break the codes for this RSA so uh, this factorization attack has uh, advanced as well so in the year of uh, 2005 I think there was this um, some research that has um, 830 uh, beats that has been like factorized uh, and so for the RSA they use like 4009 beats and things like that so with the current um, performance they can break the code and if the quantum computer comes out, then you know they can do the factorization. And then RSA will become useless. So that is sort of like um, some of like the rumors that's going around in this academia field. But it will take a lot of time being expected to develop this quantum computing. And if we do that, you know, they can also like you know use a bigger prime size to escape uh, such attacks. So, like in the near future, uh, we can uh, still use like you know RSA um, until that uh, techn technological advancement occurs. So, that was related to a public key crypto keys. That was um, how uh, it uh, was um, born, and there was this uh, thing uh, called earliest publicly known. So, this is something that was known in the. Uh, year of 1990s, but in the year of uh, 1960s, one researcher has talked about uh, RSI equivalent scheme for the public key, but he was part of, uh, you know, a British research government, and that was a time when a uh, computer was not developed, so that is why his research was kind of like uh, uncovered, was, wasn't uncovered. So that is why, like, uh, in the 1990s, it was kind of, like, known. But he wasn't able to receive the credit, the, the research in the 1960s, because that research was not uh, that well known at the time. And so there was this another um, research that um, was upgraded to another phase. So when this uh, public crypto key came out, um, uh, Goldweiser and uh, Mikali, they were the graduate students at UC Berkeley. And they were uh, the students of the um, Professor Bloom, who won the Turing Prize in the year of 1995. And so they talked about how can you play poker game over the phone. So if you play this poker game, then there are a lot of aspects or the elements that you need to consider because you need to shuffle the cards and you need to draw the cards one by one and open it and you have to look at it and you have to do the bet it and you have to do the betting and without uh, computers Get, uh, help, can you simply play um, this game over the phone? So 
it's difficult and yet you can still play over the phone so in order to solve that uh, they were able to you know draw really good outcomes uh, starting from that question so um, they wrote uh, the papers in the era of like 1982 and that was uh, related to uh, probabilistic encryption and the key question was that what is the secret so in when you make the crypto system then what is the secret and what is the uh, target targeted goal that we need to reach so those were the questions that first came out through these papers so they have uh, established this formal definition of what secret is and that is still uh, being very like uh, that is the standard uh, definition in this uh, cryptography world so they were the theoretic uh, foundations of uh, this secret and when uh, they uh, received this uh, Turing Award and there was this one article that um, talked about them and they have formalized um, the security definitions and they have also came up with uh, created the mathematical structures to validate uh, that theory and so this uh, they were the ones who brought this um, you know cryptography from art to into science so that is something that godfathers uh, could do. So these two godfathers or godmother has, um, you know, conducted this research and was able to break through uh, a lot of things. And so that is why they have received uh, this Turing Award in the year of 2012. And the other contribution that they have made to uh, get a uh, Turing Award is something that I will explain later. So related to this first contribution, so they have uh, defined two uh, security definitions. First is the uh, security semantic definition, security. So if there is an attacker, then and if there is a cipher text, they cannot gain any partial information about a secret. And so cipher text indistinguishability is that if there are two um, messages and if there are cipher texts corresponding to each message, then which cipher text is responding to what me mes message? So that is kind of um, uh, that is the example of like cipher text indistinguishability. So it is much more of like an abstract concept because you know you can't gain any information as a third party. So then how can that be like uh, formally you know expressed through um, theory? And what they did was that they um, you know proposed this simulation to define that. So simulation is something that if there's an attacker and if they're looking at some kind of like communication, then they can, you know, um, simulate that communication by themselves. And if they can't uh, gain an uh, information, then, you know, they can't gain that secret. So that is sort of like the new paradigm that came out and they were able to, uh, you know, um, prove that. And they also uh, showed that two definitions are equivalent, and so the cipher text indistinguishability has become a standard uh, definition of uh, modern cryptography. So uh, they uh, define that in terms of gain, so that is sort of like the trademark of the modern uh, cryptography. So if you look at this, uh, so this is sort of type of a game. And if you uh, look at this, watch this game, and if you give the message, and if you encrypt the first or the second uh, message, then you cannot distinguish either one, neither one. And so not only the secret uh, security definition, they also talked about how they can um, uh, achieve that is that you need to use this uh, probabilistic algorithm to do that and they were able to prove that so there are uh, papers titled uh, probabilistic encryption and that was the when it, that kind of concept did not um, was not apparent was not at, at the time so you need to have some kind of like randomness to this encryption um, process and then the probabilistic concept that needs to go in so that amongst the many ciphertexts there should be one uh, probabilistic algorithm that uh, corresponds to a lot of like ciphertexts so that is w the concept that they first um, proposed and they made the scheme out of it so they made the definition established the definition and they con constructed um, the definition 
definition as well. So that is when how um, the modern cri crypto fee became from art into science. So this is the last chapter, which is about advanced uh, cryptography, because you know uh, now it has become into a came into the science realm, and uh, we could have done like security proofs. So and now the researchers, you know, like thought about what more they can do to cryptography, and they wanted to like advance it. So. Uh, we came into the another level. So they, they may be uh, a bit uh, less credited uh, compared to the Turing Award, but there's this uh, Gatto Prize, which gives to like outstanding uh, researchers as well. So Turing Award is not just for the, the theoretical novelty, but they also look at the practicality of how it is being well used in uh, reality as well. But, you know, the uh, Gatto Prize is much more uh, interested in the theories of the researchers that are very uh, interesting. So there was Goldwasser and Mikali when they received Turing Award. They had uh, two contributions. Uh, the second uh, contribution was the interactive proof system. And in Ghetto Prize, they have already like awarded them in the year of 1993. And then before uh, Turing uh, gave uh, award uh, gave them the prize and then after that you know it kind of like advanced into differential privacy learning with errors and things like that and and this is something that has been uh you know like picked up by a uh, ghetto prizes earlier much earlier than Turing uh, prizes so what is advanced cryptography just to give you a rough definition so it goes beyond, uh, you know, encryption and signatures. So not just uh, data, they want to like protect uh, the computation as well. So that is what is called advanced cryptography. So these are some of the, um, you know, like representative like technologies or the key technologies of this advanced cryptography. So one is uh, zero knowledge proofs, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy, and fully homomorphic encryption. So the motivation behind uh, this advanced cryptography was that you know we talked about the you know advancement of like machine learning and then so there are a lot of you know data driven services that came out as well and so like these like IT companies that like started to like provide all these like personalized services such as like location services or like provide some kind of like financial services or where if we provide our um, you know like uh, purchase history then they gave us like tailored um, advertisements and things like that. But that was um, established. These services were have been established based on, you know, people, the users giving up their personal information. Because, you know, IT companies, they are providing us services, but at the same time, you know, they are collecting our personal information to create another uh, values. So, Going beyond, uh, you know, providing services to us, uh, these like personal information uh, is being are being um, abused. So this uh, like per uh, advanced crypto provides the ability to process data without ever seeing it. So all like computations can be. Um, you know, protected without any like trusted party. So that is our belief. So amongst the uh, Turing Award Prize winner, there was this name, um, Andrew Yao. And in the year of 1982, he asked a question saying that, let's say there are uh, two millionaires and if they want to know who's richer, 
But, you know, they don't want to reveal their um, exact uh, asset, um, amount of the asset that they have, and yet you still know who's richer. And that is sort of like the Yao's uh, millionaire's problem. And it can be solved through advanced uh, cryptography technology. And this is something uh, goes beyond by safely transmitting and receiving, um, sending and receiving the message. And for, in order to solve that, this is something, uh, the technology that can be used, which is called uh, zero knowledge proofs. So they just need to validate uh, the statement that we want. But other than that, they don't provide any other information. So they called it zero knowledge proofs. And this technique is widely used in cryptocurrency because, you know, like in case of like, you know, the Bitcoin, the transaction history is being publicly, you know, disclosed. But in case of GKC, they use the cryptocurrency to do the transaction, but they don't like disclose um, the remaining, the balance that you have. The next thing is called MPC. Sorry, so going back to GKP, so they have uh, the, the second contribution is related to um, MPC. So there are uh, several parties and they want to do something, but uh, you know, they want to share some information, but, but other information they don't want to disclose it. So Yao has brought in this uh, Gabriel uh, circuit, and that was sort of like the side contribution while when he received the Turing Award, and Goldwasser and Mikali also, uh, you know, brought this GMW, the new protocol, and brought uh, made a lot of uh, you know good papers. And next one is differential privacy, which was um, invented in 2006. Let's say uh, if you have Google and if you want to know which emoticons are being used the most, and if you ask the uh, the uh, frequency uh, frequently used um, emoticons to the users, then you know there is this uh, you know it could be like uh, breaching the privacy of the users. And this, uh, by using this uh, DP, you can uh, get the statistical like outcome that is quite accurate. And then that last one is called homomorphic encryption, and you can calculate uh, or comp do the computation uh, something that it has been encrypted. So you, if you have this encrypted personal information, and if you send it to the server, then they do the uh, encryption. And then uh, provide some uh, like such services that I have explained to you earlier. And it received the uh, Ghetto Prize last year. And I am also uh, have done some research in this area as well. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening.